Almost three years after he died in a tragic shooting in Atlanta, Davon Daquan Bennett, alias King Von, is still a hot topic in the rap scene. Apart from having his music still being released even in 2023, the Chicago rapper has been in the news after his private life was made public. He was implicated in various homicides and alleged crimes related to the Chicago gang scene, even earning the title of a serial killer. It's safe to say that many people, especially fellow rappers, were afraid of him. So why exactly were rappers scared of King Von? Number one, his mad affiliates. The first reason King Von was feared by rappers was because of the people he rolled around with. They say you are the sum of the five people you hang around with. Well, King Von hung around very dangerous people. Some are well known in the hip hop world, while others became famous after their deaths. Some of his affiliates included Lil Durk and T-Roy. Perhaps the most dangerous of Von's affiliates was his best friend James Johnson, alias T-Roy. Standing at around five foot one, T-Roy was a fierce shooter for the Black Disciples sect O Block. Although he was not well known to the world when he was alive, Stories about him became prominent after his death, as people he rolled with fondly spoke about him in songs and interviews. Before he died, T-Roy had been responsible for multiple shootings and murders in the Chicago gang wars. He had become so dangerous that it was rumored that he was Chief Keef's shooter. Chief Keef fueled the rumor by mentioning T-Roy in his songs. In his record, No Reason, the Chicago rapper sings, I'm cooling in the trap, getting high for no reason. T-Roy grabbed my strap, he gon' blast for no reason. In the song Savage, Chief Keef raps, T-Roy, he got the semi, he'll send your ass to heaven. Apart from that, he also alluded to T-Roy being a shooter in his track self where he raps, don't care if you with them niggas or if you by yourself. T-Roy got a gun that's bigger than him. In interviews after his death, his former affiliates praised him and also noted that he was a savage in the streets. According to rapper Boss Top, T-Roy was a fearless savage when it came to gang activities. Roy just different, you know what I'm saying? He was a real enforcer. Sure, he was a savage on all of Another one that was feeling. Another Chicago rapper, Tay Capone, revealed that T-Roy would just eat, sleep, and roll up on his ops. Troy is one of those, like, he one of them type of shit. He just wake up, eat, sleep, shit, this drill shit. Tay Capone also revealed that T-Roy's ops were afraid of the O-Block shooter. T-Roy, you ain't gotta be scared of him if you want to guy, so you know what I'm saying? But if you on that other side, you should be terrified of him. Like, like, was terrified of him, like, and for good reason. So how did young T-Roy become one of the most feared gangsters in Chicago? There are a few theories that have been floated around trying to explain why young T-Roy turned into a bloodthirsty shooter who struck fear into the hearts of his ops. According to his friend Tay Capone, T-Roy may have started his ruthless killing streak because he was tired of being picked on. Remember, he was a short guy, meaning that even at school, he was constantly being picked on. You no, know, it's probably a little nigga syndrome. You, grow, you growing up as everybody thinking you 10 years old, body got to a point where he was tired of him thinking because he little as chicken. Fed up with the treatment he got because of his short stature, he turned to the one thing that would keep all his bullies at bay. T-Roy got himself a gun. In fact, he made sure he had the best and biggest gun in the block just to show everyone who was boss. Whatever the biggest gun is, Troy got. However, another one of T-Roy's childhood friends gave insight into what really turned James Johnson into a cold-blooded killer. Former O-Block member Jay Hood revealed that T-Roy was traumatized after witnessing the death of his friend and childhood hero. On August 10th, 2011, at around 11 p.m., popular Wick City gang member Odie Perry was riding his bike on the 6400 block of South Martin Luther King Drive. The calm of the night was about to be disrupted by an event that would define the future of Wick City and 6400 block. According to multiple witnesses, as Odie rode his bike past AutoZone, a person with dreadlocks subtly approached him. Before Odie knew it, the person had drawn a pipe and let off multiple shots. Witnesses also confirmed that they saw two people running away from the crime scene and hopping into a vehicle, which sped away. The fierce shooter was left to die on the street. As he bled out waiting for an ambulance, T-Roy held him in his arms. According to Jay Hood, a former O-Block member, Odie Perry's last words to T-Roy were, they got me, bro. Then T-Roy was right there with him his last little moments and T-Roy, and, and then T-Roy said that, oh, was like, damn, they got me, bro. Like, that was his last word. Odie Perry was loved and adored by everyone in Parkway Gardens that after his death, the Wick City gang changed its name to O-Block. Even his funeral was packed as many people in the city came to pay their last respect. Overly love his funeral was packed. The people of Parkway Gardens had never had such a popular figure die at the hands of their ops. He was one of the first deaths that was from the ops. When you wanted the first to die, man, it hit harder. As a result, the death affected very many people. Odie Perry's death seemed to affect one young man in particular, the man who had heard Odie's last words, T-Roy. First, he was horrified seeing the neighborhood's idol riddled with bullets and bleeding out. Then he was saddened after it hit him that the great shooter was no more. Finally, something in him snapped. Maybe it was the fact that he was right there when he uttered his last words. Whatever it was, it changed him. Jay Hood revealed that the whole incident changed T-Roy. So that shit changed T-Roy. 
That shit tanks, he roared. He must have been traumatized by the ordeal, but one thing was certain. OD's death had to be avenged at all costs. OD had left some big shoes to fill, and T-Roy took it upon himself to fill them. It is important to note that prior to OD Perry's death, T-Roy was not really invested in violent gang activities. He used to move with guns, but never with the intention to slide on his ops. According to his longtime friend Jay Hood, they kept guns as a result of peer pressure. The older guys constantly made fun of them, so they were forced to do a lot of things they did not want to do just to fit in. Me, T-Roy, all us Vaughn, we all we used to be in cahoots. They used to have guns, but we just used to have it to so that the big guys wouldn't call us pussy. It's just like when you grow up in the hood and it's like you ain't getting no pussy, you ain't no nothing, you a lame, you're goofy. So niggas finna do what? We finna try to fing do all this. We might not even want it, but like we finna try to open ourselves up to it so niggas can't talk about us. But after OD's death, everything changed and T Roy's reign of terror began, and he was determined to slide on his ops any chance he got. He was so cocky that he would go on social media to make it clear that he was willing to kill his ops any time anywhere so my run up on me i will shoot you no problem i will shoot you among his most famous victims were Boss Trell and Lil Doc. On January 8, 2013, T-Roy and three others, including King Von, hopped into a Chevrolet Impala and slowly drove through their op's main block looking for an op to slide on. As they drove around 63rd and St. Lawrence, they spotted Marlon Monroe, alias Lil Doc. According to official reports, Lil Doc had been painting his aunt's woodlawn building. After hours of work, Lil Doc felt thirsty and decided to go to a nearby convenience store to buy a drink. As he made his way inside, T-Roy jumped out of the vehicle with his pipe in hand. He didn't waste time letting off shots. Lil Doc tried to make a run for it but was struck. He stumbled and fell into a patch of tall weeds in an empty lot near the store. The police came to investigate the shooting, cleaned up the scene, and took off. However, they did not spot Lil Doc. Lil Doc's lifeless body would not be discovered until some hours after the shooting. A 16-year-old relative who was in a rush trying to make curfew was crossing through the abandoned lot when he found his corpse in the 6300 block of South St. Lawrence Avenue. It turns out that 21-year-old Lil Doc had been out of prison for two months and was on parole for stealing a car. He was trying to get his life right. He had received a GED while in prison, was trying to get a painter's license, and had been doing maintenance for property owned by his aunt. The next op to fall was Boss Trell, who had killed one of T-Roy's friends, Sheroy Liggins. Cops discovered Liggins, who hailed from the 2200 block of East 99th Street, lying on the street with a single gunshot wound to the head. He was rushed to Stroger Hospital in critical condition, where he remained until he was pronounced dead, a few hours after being brought in. It turns out that before he met his death, Boss Trell was trying to get out of Chicago. He had lived by the gun and knew that he would die by the gun. The cycle of gang violence in Chicago was getting out of hand, and the only way to get out alive was to start life in a new city. It turns out that during the weeks prior to his death, there had been several attempts on his life. First, he had been shot at by OB 600 members. The following week, he was shot at on different days by King Von and Big A. Having panicked for his life, he decided to start life in a different part of the country. He chose Iowa and bought a bus ticket. However, he would never make it out of Chicago alive. According to Boss Trail's bus ticket, he was set to leave Chicago on November 10th, 2012. Just three days before he left, he posted on Twitter that he was eager to start his new life. Can't wait till I get my new start. His excitement was also his undoing as the tweet alerted his ops. There's no way his ops would let him escape from their grip forever. He had to be put down immediately so a plan was put in motion. Rumor has it that T-Roy and his buddies used a girl to lure Boss Trell from hiding. The girl was supposed to set up a meeting with him the next day. Boss Trell fell for it and arrived at the agreed upon site. However, he was alone as the girl he was to meet was nowhere in sight. Suddenly, a vehicle slowly pulled up a short distance away from him. It quickly dawned on him that he had been tricked and took to his heels. However, his op was hot on his trail with guns already blazing. Unfortunately, he was struck and fell as T-Roy and the rest fled the scene. Just two days before he was to leave Chicago, Boss Trell was found face down in an alley in the 2600 block of West 83rd Street with a shot to the back of the head. His ops were more than excited with the news of his death that they took to Twitter to show their delight. Boss Trell thought he could get away from the rat, but who he bump into, one tweet read. Unfortunately, T-Roy would die exactly how he had lived his life. The gang violence and murder that he so proudly lived by also claimed his life. On Valentine's Day 2017, T-Roy and a friend strolled through the 2000 block of East 71st Street in the South Shore neighborhood. As T-Roy and his friend strolled through the streets, their ops, TB and Can't Get Right, were hot on their trail. From the footage, one can see that TB and Can't Get Right were scanning the streets, searching for T-Roy. T-Roy and his associate went into a store on 71st Street. Inside the store, he was on one of the aisles having a conversation 
discussion with his associate. Seconds later, CCTV footage showed TB and Can't Get Right walking into the store and toward their rivals. TB's right hand was slightly behind him, concealing a firearm. Suddenly, TB raised his pipe and shot T. Roy, who then dropped to the floor. T. Roy was then taken to Northwestern Memorial Hospital, where he succumbed to his gunshot wound. Famous rappers who were close to him were shocked and took to Twitter to express their sadness. This included Lil Durk, Lil Reese, 600 Breezy, and Chief Keith. King Von was in prison at the time, fighting a murder charge, and, in an Instagram Live, revealed that when his mom told him about T. Roy's death, he cried, something the O-Block gang member had not done in ages. Lil Durk is also a well-known dangerous affiliate who has been caught up in gang violence. Although Lil Durk has not been indicted for any criminal acts, there has been wide speculation that he may have had a hand in the death of FBG Cash. FBG Cash relentlessly dissed King Von after his death, even going ahead to disrespect Von's mural. Now I think at some point you take the picture in front of O-Block, in yeah. front of the King Von mural. Mm -hmm. so what, what was going on with all that? Dirk told me to do that. Dirk told you to do that? Yeah. Okay. Lil Dirk even sent a cryptic message that everyone assumed was directed towards Cash, telling him to be careful. Don't diss thang if you be lingering and chasing hoes. Won't end well. That's March, the Instagram story read. Dirk was quick to send a warning to Cash in his song, Computer Murderers, where he raps sneaking pics by Von Mural like Lil Bro won't come out and spin. Strangely, rumor has it that when Cash died, he was set up by a woman. This rumor, coupled with the message that Dirk sent Cash, is the reason people think Von's affiliate had something to to do with Cash's death. This would serve as a clear warning that Vaughn's name was to be respected, even though he was already six feet under. Well, apart from T. Roy and Dirk, King Vaughn was also feared because of the gang he was affiliated to, O Block. It is a sect of the Black Disciples and among the most dangerous gangs in Chicago. After joining the rap industry, Vaughn quickly made a name for himself, and since the money was coming in, he started taking care of his fellow O Block members. He even bought some of them custom made O Block chains. Not only was O Block loyal to Vaughn, they were one big family. O Block gang members even acted as as his security. In an interview, Vaughn's former manager, 100K Track, revealed that he trusted his client's safety with guys from O-Block than he would with anyone else. The gang were willing to go out of their way for Vaughn. In fact, as we will later see, five of them are facing potential life sentences because of Vaughn. With O-Block on his side, Vaughn was unstoppable. It is even rumored that O-Block were responsible for the murder of Lil Pop, a close affiliate of Quando Rondo. Remember, Quando Rondo is largely blamed for King Vaughn's death. Although Quando did not pull the trigger that ended Vaughn's life, he dissed the late Chicago rapper in his music. Music, which may have angered Vaughn's guys who were still grieving. His words in an interview with All Around TV may have been the final straw as all hell broke loose and Quando's life became a living hell. In the interview, the rapper said, however some shit come to me, that's how I'm about to go about that shit death threat all you want to, bro. F that shit. That's just some words, my n Go do an action. Well, on the 19th of November, 2022, at a gas station in Beverly Grove, several gunmen ambushed Quando's entourage and opened fire. Although Quando Rondo was not hit, numerous reports show that he was the intended target. Unfortunately, a member of Quando's entourage was hit. His friends loaded him into the black SUV and drove about a mile to West Hollywood, where they were stopped by police officers responding to the shooting scene. Cops gave CPR to the victim, who was still breathing but was unconscious. Video of Quando screaming as they pulled the body out of the car quickly went viral on social media. An ambulance rushed the victim to the hospital. However, he succumbed to his injuries and died. Quando later identified the victim as Lulpab after sharing a photo posing with him on Instagram. While no one from O-Block claimed the hit, it wouldn't be surprising to find out that just like FEG Cash, Quando was being targeted for Vaughn's death. All this just goes to show that the people who Vaughn was constantly around were killers, dangerous men who were not afraid to pull the trigger and end their enemies' lives. If you messed with Vaughn, you messed with all of them making rappers afraid of him. Well, was Vaughn anything like his friends? Was he a cold-hearted murderer like his affiliates? Number two, his bloodlust. While many of King Vaughn's fans would not like to admit the rapper's criminal past, however, his friends have come forward and revealed his lifestyle in interviews. Apart from that, the feds have uncovered enough evidence tying him to shootings and murders. After Vaughn's death, videos popped up all over YouTube detailing the murders he had carried out. He had even earned the title serial killer. While many deaths and shootings have been connected to the Chicago rapper, there are three that the feds have confirmed that Vaughn actually took part in. These involved Gakira Barnes, FBG Duck, and Alexander Weatherspoon. Before we get to the shootings and murders that made King Vaughn feared in the rap industry, it is important to revisit some of his famous brawls. Apart from using guns, Vaughn was also feared because he was never afraid afraid of using his fists. Both in jail and in the outside world, Vaughn was ready to beat up his ops on the ready. Interestingly, some of the fights he was involved in were caught on camera. In this video, Vaughn can be seen walking up to a fellow inmate and attacking him. As Vaughn and his victim trade blows, other inmates intervene and separate them. Another shocking video emerged where Vaughn slipped out of his cuffs and attacked his op. In the video, King Vaughn is seen hurriedly getting up and walking towards an inmate. The two start struggling with their cuffs. After a few seconds, Vaughn can be seen out of his handcuffs and heads towards an inmate. The inmate tries to hide, but Vaughn catches
catches him and starts raining blows on the inmate and knocking him to the ground. Two inmates join in to help Vaughn. Fortunately, prison guards come to the rescue and both inmates are taken out of the bullpen. Well, people were not really surprised when the video was leaked, as Vaughn had a reputation of sliding on ops any chance he got. One thing that baffled everyone, including the prison guards, was how the rapper was able to get out of cuffs. You usually don't really see dudes be able to slip out of the handcuffs like that. Yeah, that was crazy. I don't know how he did that? it. But he did it. Even the guards were baffled at how he had managed to slip out of his cuffs, yet he was cuffed properly. You can even see that he was cuffed correctly. As soon as you can see the marks from the cuffs on his arm. Turns out that the inmate who was attacked was 051 Freaky. And according to Lil Reese, Vaughn may have jumped his op because he had a disrespectful tattoo of L.A. Capone. L.A. Capone was an up-and-coming rapper who had close ties to Lil Durk. On September 26, 2013, while leaving the recording studio around 6 p.m., L.A. Capone went to look for his car down the street. And as he was walking down an alley near 70th Street and Stony Island Avenue, he was approached by an individual later identified as Lil Mick from 051 Young Money, a rival gang. Capone was shot and killed. Even outside jail, Vaughn was not afraid Roe get his hands dirty. He was caught on video attacking fellow rapper Quando Rondo. Unfortunately, this altercation saw him get shot and finally lose his life minutes later in a hospital. That day, Vaughn and his entourage flew from New York to Atlanta, where he was set to have an album release party at Opium Nightclub for his first album, Welcome to Oblock. After leaving the club, everyone knew that they would all be heading back to their rented Airbnb to call it a night. However, Vaughn had other ideas and took a detour, heading for Monaco Hookah Lounge. Once at the club's parking lot, Vaughn waited for his security to give him the go-ahead to enter the club. As he waited, one of his homeboys notified Vaughn that he had just seen Quando Rondo sleeping in his car. In a split second, Vaughn was out of the car and heading toward Quando's direction. At this point, Quando had exited his car and was on his way to the club. Vaughn, with a few members of his crew behind him, proceeded to attack Quando, knocking him to the ground. Vaughn's guys joined in and started raining blows on Quando as he tried in vain to get away from his attackers. In a split second, one of Quando's homeboys, who was later identified as Lil Tim, appeared from behind their vehicle with a gun in hand and started letting off shots. Vaughn was fatally shot and died during surgery at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. Apart from using his fists, Vaughn was feared because he was a fearless shooter. One of the most talked about murders that cops have confirmed he committed was that of 17-year-old Gakira Barnes. Popularly known as K.I., the teenage girl wreaked havoc on O Block and its allies. In fact, she is credited for having killed the much-loved Odie Perry. She even openly bragged about it on social media. She posted insult after mocking Odie's death, even thanking him for being target practice. Rumor had it that she had even stolen Odie's gun and posted photos brandishing the weapon on social media. These antics angered her ops, especially King Vaughn, who started planning how to kill her. Although she was killed in the same way she had murdered Odie Perry, K.I., who was later nicknamed the female assassin by blogs, had been a thorn in the flesh for O Block members. K.I. was part of the Gangster Disciples gang, which was in direct conflict with O Block. Specifically, she belonged to the STLEBT set, also known as Tukaville or Tuka Gang. Reports suggest that K.I. wanted to be a social worker when she grew up. In fact, her mother described her as a sweet, loving girl. Although she was already part of STLEBT from early on in her teenage years, everything changed on the evening of January 12, 2011. K.I.'s close friend was waiting for a bus on the 600 block of East 63rd Street. That friend was Shondale Gregory, popularly known as Tuka. He was gunned down and died on the scene of the shooting. This changed young Gakira Barnes and turned her into a cold-blooded killer that was well-respected in the Chirac streets and feared by her ops. It didn't take long for her to become a ruthless killer in the streets of Chicago and was often called Snoop in the streets. The name was in reference to a ruthless murderer on the fictional television series The Wire. Rumor on the street has it that before she died, K.I. had murdered someone by the young age of 14 and might have been responsible for as many as 20 murders. She was hated by her ops and was even referred to as a pest. K.I. was like a pest. I remember her riding on a bike like, you know, taunting us and nigga, we trying to chase her back on the block, but she get out of that skirt on the bike, she gone. And yo, I, I, she was somebody that like, you, on April 11th, a hooded gunman shot Barnes in front of a home in the 6400 block of South Eberhardt. K.I. was hit nine times in the mouth, neck, and chest before running and collapsing on a neighbor's doorstep and passing out. She later succumbed to her injuries at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. That day, she was walking with her brother, F.B.G. Butter, and a friend. All three sustained gunshot wounds, but it seemed as though K.I. was the intended target as the other two survived. King Vaughn was arrested in connection with the shooting after he was identified by eyewitnesses, but was soon released as police were unable 
unable to meet the burden of proof in court. Ultimately, the charges were rejected because of the lack of strong evidence to convict Vaughn. But years later, after King Vaughn died in a tragic shooting in Atlanta, reports surfaced showing that Vaughn had indeed killed K.I. According to police reports, the shooter wore a gray hoodie and blue jeans. He approached the three victims, produced a handgun, and began firing in the direction of the victims, striking all three. He then entered an unknown vehicle and fled the scene. J. Hood, who was very close to Vaughn at the time, narrated what happened the day K.I. died. He admits that Vaughn confessed to killing Gakira Barnes. And then Vaughn walked up to me, and I'm, I shook his hand. He, like, looked straight. And then I looked straight. And I'm like, why? Why, why are you telling me to look straight? He, like, look straight. And when I'm finna say to you, don't look at me after I tell you. According to the former O Block member, Vaughn told him that he had shot three people and that K.I. was the last one of the three he had shot and killed. I just run up on K.I. And, um, you know, why I just ran up on them niggas? And caught, and caught K.I., she was the last one running out of the gate. As soon as Vaughn told him this, sirens could be heard in the distance getting closer. And I'm just in my head like, damn, for real? And sure enough, after he told me that sirens came. However, K.I.'s brother, F.B.G. Butter, who was present at the scene, denies this. He denies the fact that Vaughn was responsible for his sister's death. Man, what I know is, oh my dad, Vaughn didn't kill Kai. I got shot too, I was right there. I got shot too. I saw the motherfucker who popped up. He did. Despite strong opposition from Butter, police reports emerged in 2023 showing that he had confessed to cops that Vaughn had indeed killed his sister. According to the documents, Cooperator 3 was also present for and witnessed the murder of his sister, Gakira Barnes, by O Block member Davon Bennett. This is not the only murder that was connected to the late Chicago rapper. The death of Carlton Weekly, alias F.E.G. Duck, was also linked to Vaughn, however. Cops uncovered all this after he had passed away. On August 4th, 2020, news broke out that F.E.G. Duck had been shot and killed at Michigan Avenue and East Oak Street in the Gold Coast area of Chicago. Everyone could tell that it was a hit, and it was not long before five members of O-Block were arrested in connection to the murder. On October 13, 2020, the feds raided O-Block and arrested five men for F.E.G. Duck's murder. These were Charles Liggins, a.k.a. C. Murder, Kenneth Robertson, a.k.a. Kenny Mack, to Carlos Offord, a.k.a. Los, Christopher Thomas, a.k.a. C. Thang, and Marcus Smart, a.k.a. Muwa. The five were charged with murder, unlawful use of firearms, racketeering, and assault with dangerous weapons. The charges carried a mandatory minimum of life upon conviction. There was even talk of the prosecution seeking the death penalty. The feds revealed that someone had put a $50,000 bounty on Duck's head. However, no one was willing to do it. The informant further revealed that the same individual had bumped up his offer to $100,000. Someone from O Block was willing to part ways with $100,000 in exchange for Duck's death. Well, at the time, Vaughn was making it big in the industry. He may have been the one that put out the bounty. Although the informant did not reveal the individual's name, they told the cops that the said person had rewarded the killers with custom-made O-Block chains. The pieces were starting to fall into place as a video had earlier surfaced on YouTube of none other than King Von giving O-Block members custom-made chains. Apart from this, among all the O-Block members, he was the one who had that kind of money since he had made it big in his music career. After internet sleuths did some digging, they found out that the suspected informant was none other than King Von's little brother, Louis V. Documents from the Fed showed that the snitch had been arrested for unlawful use of a weapon on the 17th of August. August 2020. Unfortunately, no one else close to Vaughn or even from O-Block was arrested on the same day or on the same charge. That left only Louis, who fit the description in the police documents. Apart from that, he also could have known of Vaughn's move on F.E.G. Duck since he was close to him. Rappers now had more reason to be scared of Vaughn as he could place bounties on his enemies. One person was lucky enough to encounter King Vaughn and live to tell the tale. This was none other than Alexander Weatherspoon. On February 5th, 2019, shots were fired in the parking lot of The Varsity, a popular restaurant located in mid town Atlanta. Cops responded to the incident within minutes and found a 23-year-old man wounded outside a vehicle in the parking lot. The 23-year-old was later identified as Alexander Weatherspoon and had suffered a gunshot wound to his leg. Witnesses told the authorities that an SUV with 300 plastered on the side was seen speeding away from the scene after the shots were fired. Apart from shooting the victim, the rappers also robbed Alexander Weatherspoon of a gold chain and $30,000 and stole his vehicle. In the months that followed, three suspects were arrested in connection to the shooting. These were King Vaughn, Lil Durk, and Bezu. Interestingly, Lil Durk was considered the main suspect in this case. It turns out the rapper had five charges to his name. These included criminal attempt to commit murder, aggravated assault, unlawful association with criminal street gang, to conduct or participate in crime, possession of a firearm during commission of a felony, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Cops alleged that they even had him on camera firing his weapon at Weatherspoon. You see Mr. Banks' arm out the window firing several shots. 
at the victim, towards the victim. However, after Vaughn died, all the charges against Lil Durk were dropped. That was not the most shocking part. It turns out that Vaughn would not have beaten the charge. In a statement released by the DA, Mrs. Fawny Willis, if co-defendant Davon Bennett, aka King Vaughn, had not died in 2020, he would have been indicted for this incident. It was Vaughn who had shot Weatherspoon. Interestingly, Weatherspoon was a member of the Vice Lords gang, which meant that he was an op, and Vaughn knew how to handle his ops with ease. Judging from the people he grew up with and hung around, it is not surprising that Vaughn turned out to be a violent murderer. It is also not surprising that he struck fear into the hearts of his enemies.